And I'd like to welcome everyone today to the annual meeting, the virtual annual meeting, and our workshop today on advocacy uh, for myotonic dystrophy research and funding. We're going to have a 50 minute session. We're going to walk you through a few really exciting topics, and hopefully, folks will come away with a lot more knowledge and uh, motivation to become an advocate. So before we get started, I wanted to thank our presenting sponsor for today's workshop, which is Harmony Biosciences. They are a silver level sponsor, um, and it's a company that is involved in rare neurological disorders, and they're focused in on unmet medical needs. So we really want to give them a big shout out and thank you for their, uh, their support and partnership. I'd encourage folks to attend the industry uh, updates that are later on after our session, uh, if they'd want to learn more about Harmony and some of the work that they are doing. So let me move forward into our next slide here. Okay, so I wanted to first introduce the folks who will be joining us today. So we're gonna be joined by an old friend of mine, Dana Richter, and Dana is currently the Senior Policy Advisor for Senator Shelley Moore Capito, who's a Republican Senator from West Virginia, uh, who sits on the Senate Appropriations Committee. She's a very senior member of the Senate, uh, and a very influential member of the Senate. Dana and I have known each other a long time, uh, Dana and I first met each other when we worked together at the Arthritis Foundation many years ago. Uh, Dana went on to work for several members of the House of Representatives uh, and then worked for the National Breast Cancer Coalition uh, before ultimately going, in, going back into Congress and working for Senator uh, Capito. Uh, and one thing to highlight about Dana, uh, I happen to be a, a Democrat and Dana is a Republican and at a day and age when uh, partisan tensions and conflict seems to be high, um, Dan and I are, are still friends from across the aisle and I, I, it gives me some hope to know that uh, good people can still work together and figure out you know, ways to, uh, to find common ground on issues. And so she's a terrific friend uh, and I'm really, really grateful that uh, she's able to join us today uh, for this. Um, our next presenter is Suzanne Perkins um, and she is going to be joining us. So Suzanne is a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Michigan. Uh, she's a support group leader and she has a daughter who was diagnosed at 16 with EM1. Uh, she's gotten involved in her state capital in Michigan in Ann Arbor in Rare Diseases Day. Um, and she's worked very closely with her state senator, Senators Capito and Peters, on a variety of advocacy issues that are really important to the community. So we're really glad to have Suzanne join us today. Our next presenter is Suzette Eisen, who is a nurse. She's a support group co-facilitator in Indianapolis, Indiana. She's a registered nurse. Uh, her son, Billy Dean, was diagnosed with DM1 in 2004. Uh, and she's been a Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation volunteer from the very beginning in 2007. Um, so both Suzanne and Suzette are gonna talk about their experiences working on the peer-reviewed medical research program. So what we're gonna talk about today, these are our objectives for our session. So we're gonna learn about the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation's advocacy successes, our research advocacy plans and how you can help increase federal funding for DM research. You're gonna get an insider perspective from a senior US Senate health policy staffer, Dana Richter, who's gonna walk you through effective advocacy strategies and the latest on health policy and budget issues. And finally, from Suzanne and Suzette, we're gonna get an understanding of how the Department of Defense peer reviewed medical research program awards DM research grants and how you can become a consumer reviewer who can help us further advance and grow DM research within this program. So the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, we're gonna walk you through briefly some of our successes and things that we've accomplished as an organization over this decade plus that I'm gonna review. So there's a lot of really important things that I think we as an organization uh, need to talk about and be proud of and, and really understand fully. So one of the issues that we got involved in very early on that I had the pleasure of working with many folks on the board and the community on, um, we, the, the community recognized that you know, there was an opportunity within the social security program where there is disability benefits that include benefits and also healthcare coverage. Um, but the road to securing those benefits were difficult and many times required you know, hiring an attorney and doing you know, a great many things to prove that you should be eligible for this or you or somebody that you care for should be uh, involved. So we worked directly with the Social Security Administration leadership in Baltimore. We had many meetings. We brought in community folks to explain um, congenital myotonic dystrophy. And the goal was to become eligible for the Compassionate Allowance Program. 
And what the Compassionate Allowance Program does is it allows them to very quickly identify serious diseases and conditions that meet Social Security standards for disability benefits. And what it does is it creates an expedited pathway for folks to qualify for those benefits. And so Social Security, a year after this, designated this um, designated DM to be eligible for this program. So this was a major success that we are very, very proud of as an organization. Also, um, working with the community, Myotonic Dystrophy was one of the first organizations to host its own patient-focused drug development meeting that included senior Food and Drug Administration leadership to highlight perspectives of patients and caregivers as part of an initiative and in a partnership, not just with the regulators who approve drugs and determine their safety and efficacy, but also with our partners in the biopharmaceutical industry, so that we would ultimately create more of a dialogue between regulators and innovators and scientists so they can understand what are some of the issues that are most important to our community? What are some of the, the symptoms or challenges that we want to most directly impact so that we can understand that and work together on that? And that led to the first ever myotonic dystrophy voice of the patient report that was delivered to the FDA in April of 2017. What we're going to talk about a lot today is the myotonic dystrophy found or the myotonic dystrophy program within the Department of Defense peer reviewed medical research program. So this program was established about two decades ago, largely under the leadership of the breast cancer community, which at the time was um, the research program was way underfunded at the National Institutes of Health. And so an effort was made within the United States Senate to create a program within the Department of Defense's research program to fund and look at diseases like breast cancer. The program has grown significantly over the years. And our organization saw this as an opportunity to expand the opportunity for researchers to secure research dollars to study myotonic dystrophy. So we were successful in working with members of the Senate to become included in this program as part of the fiscal year 2018 budget. And one thing to know here was this started actually in an advocacy program that was around the, the annual meeting that took place in Washington, DC in 2015. And the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation hosted a briefing in the United States Senate that involved Major Mark Sullivan from Virginia, whose brother or whose stepbrother, um, had been dishonorably discharged from the military um, because he had myotonic dystrophy at the time that was not diagnosed. And so he was later diagnosed afterwards. So he had a very important and compelling story to share about his brother, uh, his stepbrother, who had a very difficult time in the military as a result of myotonic dystrophy. He was joined by David Gillies, who was a, or still is, he's a, a staffer on the Democratic side of the aisle for the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee Department of Defense. And he talked about the PRMRP program and how we could potentially become involved. And we were also joined by Dr. Stephen Katz, who at the time was the head of the National Institutes for Arthritis and Musculoskeletal, or Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases at the NIH. And he was at the time the co-chair of the Muscular Dystrophy Coordinating Committee at the NIH. So since our success in being added to this program with the help of a few senators that you're gonna see in subsequent slides, we have had $6 million in myotonic dystrophy review grants awarded. Uh, and some of our colleagues who are gonna join us in a few minutes are gonna talk about uh, the work that they've done on the peer review process and what happens there. So as I mentioned, we've had $6 million roughly in award grants. So that's been $3.1 million in fiscal year 2018 and $2.4 million in fiscal year 19. The 2020 grants are actually in process as we speak, and they haven't been announced yet, but when they are, we will have information um, to share with folks on that. And in fact, if you are up on the website for the conference, I've posted a couple slides and there is an Excel spreadsheet that will show you the actual awards that were granted, who got the awards, who were the principal investigators, what are the topics of their research, where are those institutions located, how much money were they awarded, so you can really understand uh, the real, you know, tangible value of this effort. So this is just a list of some of the research that's been funded. Uh, again, like I said, you can go onto the uh, spreadsheet and you can look through some of this, but we see research in Illinois and Florida and Mass General. So it's really exciting stuff. This is something that um, also folks can go to the NIH website and pull up. You can find and search, you know, where the significant major, even rare diseases, they will list out how much they have funded publicly. 
So you can see the timeline for research spending for myotonic dystrophy. So again, we're looking at FY16, 2016, which was at 9 million. There's been some growth. Uh, it's been kind of at a steady state. I wouldn't say that we've seen some significant expansion here, but we're at a steady state. Um, so the, the last actual fund you can look at is from 2019. And again, if you go to the NIH site, you can actually click on the number, uh, that $12 million number, and it will pull up all the grants that were awarded. So the 2020 and the 2021, these are the estimated amounts of funding that we're going to see, but they're not, they haven't been finalized yet. And then these are some examples of some of the grant award amounts, uh, University of Virginia, University of Iowa, University of Rochester, and some of the work that's doing there. So the advocacy that we do in Congress to continue to grow funding for the NIH, you know, this shows where it's going. This work actually leads to, you know, really smart and brilliant scientists doing the kind of work and asking the kind of questions that we want that's going to lead us to, you know, treatments and eventually a cure. So going back again to some of the history here, I want to point out some really important testimony that took place in 2014. Um, so Kayla, uh, you see here, and her mom, Lisa Harvey. Um, Lisa was a founding executive director of the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, and they were still very actively involved. Um, this is Kayla testifying before Congress at age nine. And Kayla was an honor roll student she was invited to join the student council, and um, she's really been an inspiration for so many people um, with congenital myotonic dystrophy. And um, she and her mom played a really important role in Congress reauthorizing the, uh, the Muscular Dystrophy Care Act. And this is something that has created tremendous awareness at NIH uh, around you know, the, the myriad of, 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 myotonic, or of muscular dystrophies that includes myotonic dystrophy. Uh, it created a coordinating committee. So when I mentioned Dr. Stephen Katz and the work that he was doing as the co-chair of that committee, that was created as a result of the MD Care Act. It also created Wellstone Centers. Uh, there is one Wellstone Center that's funded that is focused solely on myotonic dystrophy. Uh, and it's also spawned um, surveillance networks that allow us to better understand the prevalence of myotonic dystrophy and, and how we can uh, do more to improve care and improve clinical guidelines. There's just a wealth of wonderful things that are happening uh, and it's so important to recognize the work that Kayla and Lisa did to make that happen. Um, more recently, Tim Halen from Massachusetts spoke at the, in the House of Representatives before the Labor, Health and Human Services Appropriations Committee. This was at the public witness hearing. So about 30 to 40 groups uh, testified that day before Congress, before this important subcommittee and highlighted um, you know, what it's like to live with myotonic dystrophy and why is research so important. And it was an incredibly compelling. Uh, and if you have a chance to go and look and, and listen to Tim's testimony, it was very moving and really did a lot to, again, continue to increase awareness uh, among folks in Congress about um, this rare genetic disorder and, and how folks can do to improve upon it. So as a result of some of the work that you've seen here, uh, this has led Congress to include report language in bills that fund the NIH. So in this case, in 2021, which is the current appropriations bill that Congress is considering, in the House of Representatives this summer, they have issued in their report, I'm just gonna read through this real quick so you'll have an understanding of this. They say the committee recognizes that there are significant opportunities to advance science regarding the causes of myotonic dystrophy, a serious genetic, degenerative genetic condition, and support current efforts to develop the first ever FDA approved treatments for this inherited genetic disorder. The committee, this is the Committee on Appropriations, directs the NIH to prioritize the recruitment of young researchers to this field and grow the number of high quality research proposals submitted per peer review, as these efforts hold significant promise to major advances across many neurodegenerative diseases, particularly other triplet repeat expansion diseases. The committee requests an update on these activities in the fiscal year 2021 congressional budget justification. So when the president comes to Congress next year in January and gives the State of the Union address, or probably February given the election, right after that is when the president will submit to Congress their proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. And what Congress is saying is that report needs to include an understanding of where the NIH is on this request. So again, there's going to be follow-up on this, and this will continue, we hope, to generate more support and funding within NIH for myotonic dystrophy research. 
So I mentioned that we've had some champions, folks who've stepped up and really been a huge help to this organization. So here you're going to see uh, the first awards that were co-given to Senators Feinstein from California and Senator Durbin from Illinois. Um, you see Woody Kessel there and Martha Brown, who were both on the board. Martha is currently the vice chair of the board um, and is a resident of California. So she was there to present the award as a constituent. Um, so we have pictures with these folks and we presented them with an award and again, wanted to thank them because these were the folks that went to the Appropriations Committee and made sure that myotonic dystrophy was added to the PR, PR MRP program, you know, without their intervention. So our advocates communicated to them the importance. These two senators then took their, the, the action to get us in the bill. And then that led to the program starting, but it had to start with constituents saying to them, I, you know, either care for someone with myotonic dystrophy or I have myotonic dystrophy. This is important. This is why we should be included in the program. And that, you know, that work led to real tangible research. We wanted to thank them, you know, for their support and their friendship to the organization. So our next award winners were actually my former boss, uh, Congresswoman Rosa Delara from Connecticut. I was Rosa's chief of staff years ago. Uh, and there's Rosa on the right hand side with Molly White and with Martha. And on the other side, we have Adam Schiff, who is a congressman from California. Um, many folks are probably familiar with him. There's Martha and her family. Uh, and Senator Congressman Schiff had done a lot to help um, with some of the research activities going on at Stanford uh, and really helped drive the good work that's going on there. And we wanted to thank him for his support and work on that. And he's also been very supportive of the PRMRP program. So in the work that we do here every day, there's opportunities where the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation is the driving force. If not for the work that you know, advocates across the country are doing, uh, things like the PRMRP designation absolutely wouldn't happen. Um, but there's other opportunities where as a rare genetic disorder, we wanna partner with folks so that we're stronger. Um, and so we're very closely partnering with NORD, which is the National Organization for Rare Disorders. So that's a patient advocacy group that's been around for many years and they're focused on rare diseases. What qualifies as a rare disease is under the Orphan Drug Act that was passed by Congress in 1983. An orphan condition or a rare condition is a condition that affects 200,000 people or less. Um, so these are groups like ours that, that are also in the rare space. And then another partner is the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases, which is a newer entrant into the space. It's been around for about a decade. Uh, and we work with these folks on anywhere from newborn screening program, um, issues around insurance coverage, um, pre-existing conditions, really important things, but ones when it's really important to have a unified voice. Uh, and then lastly, we, we partner with our friends up north in Canada at the Marigold Foundation, and they're involved in advocating and working to support, you know, meaningful treatments for orphan diseases, and they have a particular focus on myotonic dystrophy, and we are very grateful for their friendship and their partnership and their support. So this is just a list of a few of our federal partners that we've talked about as we work through a lot of the work that we do. We've got the House of Representatives, we have the Senate, we have the NIH, we have the Food and Drug Administration, and we have the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, which is the umbrella organization that oversees the PRMRP program. So with that, let me pause for a second here, and I want to give my colleague, Dana Richter, an opportunity to unmute and join us. So Dana's going to spend about 15 minutes talking to folks about her perspective on the front lines of public policy in the United States Senate, you know, working for Senator Capito, who sits on the subcommittee that I mentioned, where we saw Tim testifying. Dana staffs Senator Capito, who sits on that subcommittee in the United States Senate. So that subcommittee has jurisdiction and funds the National Institutes of Health, the CDC, the NIH, um, you know, very important organizations and, and or federal agencies that, that we care deeply about. So let me take a pause and I'm going to allow Dana to step up and, and give her um, her presentation. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, let's see. Thanks, Kevin. Um, it's a pleasure. And um, I want to thank all of you for inviting me to join you here today. Um, as Kevin said, I have had the um, unique privilege to not to work in both the House and the Senate, as well as with the um, 
the Arthritis Foundation and the National Breast Cancer Foundation. So I've had the privilege of being on both sides of the table when talking about advocacy um, and kind of have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly about all of this. So um, one of the things that um, Kevin mentioned was that um, we're in the middle of the appropriations process. And I thought I'd start off by giving a little update. He had had a figure on, um, he had shown you the language from the house side, um, as well as a figure for um, the funding for this year. Well, the Senate this year, unfortunately, is, um, is dragging a little in um, getting our information to it, getting our work done. Um, fortunately, uh, the appropriations committees usually are some of the most um, bipartisan. Um, a lot of committees, as you know, I'm sure you've seen, they are at all times very, very partisan. Um, their members are, it's very adversarial. Um, fortunately for the Appropriations Committee, it's usually they're able to work on a, they don't agree on anything by, by any stretch of the imagination, but they're able to work together. And that's kind of been, especially in the Senate, one of the, one of the things the committee's very proud of. Unfortunately, this year, um, that kind of broke down and I just consider it part of the, the wonder that is 2020. And we have, um, been unable to actually bring any of our bills to the to be marked up which is what they call when they get to the they get to the final stage back in the day they were actually marking them up with pencils and changing things now it's a little bit of a more of a um just an official stage of the process um but we haven't gotten there and the bills haven't passed on the floor so um, where we are is, as many of you have seen, the House has already passed what we call a continuing resolution to keep the government funded. Um, this will allow um, the CDMRP program to continue to fund um, and to move forward with those 2020 grants um, until we get fiscal year 2021. The Senate has not passed it yet. Um, we like to wait to the very last minute, like the kid on Sunday night, um, waiting to do their homework. Um, funding runs out on September 30th, which is the end of the fiscal year. And that, that is this week, this Wednesday. So we are um, expecting to pass the bill on Wednesday. Um, and then the president will have to sign it into law and that will go through December 11th and um, till after the election. And at that point, we'll be in what's known as the lame duck period um, after the election. And with, with the members who are no longer members still there, um, we'll see what happens with the presidency. That's kind of unknown what's going to happen then. We could, you know, go ahead and, fun and, you know, work on the bills and get them all done in that period, or we could do another continuing resolution. Um, this year more than ever with the president you know with the presidential election with the senate um potentially changing my majorities um there's really no way to tell what's going to be next um but uh, the good part for all of you is that a lot of the funding that um kevin was talking about whether it's the funding for the national institutes of health the centers for disease control and protection or the cdmrp program does have a lot of bipartisan support in the Senate. Um, so hopefully um, we, will, we will get things done and things will um, continue on and allow a lot of additional grants to be made. Um, as far as whether we will see what the Senate bills look like, that's still kind of up in the air. Sometimes they release them um, even before they mark them up um, a draft. Um, sometimes they don't, and we're not sure what it's going to be. So that's kind of where we are. Now, I'm going to go back, and what I did was to talk to you. Kevin brought up that all the different advocacy successes the foundation has had, and that's all because of the advocates. Um, if, you, if an organization doesn't have advocates or isn't effective, unfortunately, you know, nothing happens. Um, it's the squeaky wheel, wheel who gets the grease. And 
that is so evident in Congress because um, there are a lot of groups on Capitol Hill. There are a lot of um, groups in general, and then a lot of groups that represent different diseases. So you have to let people know about, and also, you know, sometimes people, you know, one of the first things I'm gonna say is you have to educate people on the disease and let people know, cause some people, cause some staffers, I'll be honest, as far as staffers go, I'm kind of Methuselah. Um, there are a lot of staffers who might've just graduated from college, or this might be their first job, or two weeks ago, they were handling transportation issues. So you have to educate them and that's, that's your job. The first question I'm gonna start out is one that I have gotten over the course of um, working with advocates. Um, you always wanna meet with the member of, of Congress, whether the Congressman or the Senator. It's exciting, they're the names that you've heard. The name Dana Richter doesn't mean anything to you, but you said, am I wasting my time if I meet with a staffer? Um, Cause a lot of you probably will. Um, of course, I'm biased as a staffer, but I honestly don't think it is in any way, shape, or form a waste of your time. First of all, you'll probably have a little more time with the staffer than you would with the member. Um, and to be honest, the staffer is going to be the one who makes the decisions over whether this is something their boss hears about again. They're going to decide whether, you know, this is something their boss is going to um, support in an appropriations bill, is going to support um, different policies and practices. Um, you want to, so the staffer's not a bad person to really get to understand your issues, understand why this is so important to you, and also understand why it should be important to, um, to them. So, um, so don't, don't necessarily, it's exciting to meet with the, the Senator or the member of Congress, but staff, there's a lot of good parts about meeting with staff too. And so then once you actually get into your meeting, what are the things that the staffer actually wants to hear? And as I said, one of the first things is give some information about the disease. Um, don't assume that the staffer knows anything about, um, about your situation, about the disease. And then the most important thing I think is to tell your story. The staffer can go online, they can go, y'all have a great website. Um, they can go on the website and learn the, you know, black and white facts about the disease. But the thing that's going to make you unique and make, the, and make what you're asking for so unique is your story. Whether it's your story, your child's story, your parent's story or a sibling's story. Um, walk them through your experience and really let them know um, why this is so important for you and why it's so important that Congress take action. Um, another thing that's really important, Kevin had shown that um, different, you know, the funding that went to different institutions. If you have that funding and you're going to see Senator, you know, Sen Senator, um, Warren and Sen, you know, and Markey from Massachusetts, let them know that Mass General got funding. That's really great information to have because, I mean, while, while they're interested in, you know, all the funding and the total for the country, knowing that that's going to, going to the district and going to um, really help institutions, it brings it home and it makes it very, you know, I think it was Tip O'Neill who said all politics is local and it just makes it extra important and it really lets them know. And the same way that if you have statistics on what the impact of the disease is on the state, that's really helpful for the staffer because that might be something that I know when I go in and talk to my boss about different groups I met with, she'll be like, well, you know, how many people do we have in West Virginia, especially for a disease that's rarer? And, you know, oh, what, you know, where are they going for care? Where, so any information you can provide. Um, I think one of the most important things I will say is um, make sure you will have, you have a great advocacy staff and you will have asks in the meeting, whether it is to fund the National Institutes of Health, to, to make sure that um, the, the congressionally directed medical research programs are funded. Make sure you make these asks. 
the best I will say, I've been in meetings. If no one asks me for anything, you know, that's a very easy meeting. I can walk out without any homework. Um, but that's not, that's not what you want. You want to leave the staffer with next steps. So make the asks, make them firm, and set a timeline for when you're going to be following up. A lot of times, you know, folks will ask me, you know, is, you know, should I follow up with you in a week? You know, what's the best time for you? And, um, and I say a week because a lot of times I'm doing back-to-back -back meetings or in these days calls. And a lot of times till Friday when things calm down a little bit more, I'm not even going through and figuring out, you know, what I need to follow up with, with the Senator or what, you know, what everyone was talking about. So give the staff for a little bit of time, but not too much time. And then the other thing is follow up, follow up, follow up. The, if, you know, I'd like to say that I automatically would get on every ask that people made me, but a lot of times I need the little nudge because you have to realize the staffer, your meeting might be 15, 20 minutes, especially in our busiest times, I might have 10 other meetings. So there's a chance that even if, you've done a great job, you've let me know what this means to West Virginia, you've let me know, you know, why this is so important to you and why, you know, this really matters. Unfortunately, by the end of the day, they all sometimes blend together. Even, you know, even the advocates do an excellent job. So follow up with me. Um, it might be as simple as one thing to think of, drop a really short email just thanking the staffer for meeting and just like putting a bullet point or two about the different ask and just remind them that you'll be following up. And then follow up in the next week and make sure you do it. Um, follow up and, you know, press them for answers um, because that's, you know, that's the way they're gonna then have to go to their boss and say, hey, I met with these folks, can we do this? And, and then as the process moves forward, um, stay in touch with them. Um, it's, you know, I think a great thing is if you have events, if you have anything going on, if, there re if there's things that happen with research, drop them a note, forward them an article. I mean, you don't have to become their best new pen pal because um, you're busy, they're busy, but it helps a lot if you can keep them engaged and, um, and just help. I think a relationship is so important because then when you're reaching out and asking for something, you've provided something too. And it, I think it just makes it much easier to go back. Um, I'm trying to think of any other really good things. Um, a lot of people ask about meeting in the district or the state. Um, I think there's kind of a mixed bag of that. I know generally when over the years, members have seemed to be getting back less and less. Um, to the state. And I know for us, sometimes my boss wants to be out and about. So it might not always be the easiest thing, but it is an opportunity. So each office is different. So I think those are the main things for me. Um, I just say you, what you're doing is so important. I think that's one of the things that I just want to leave you with, that it is a, um, it's important for you, it's important for the members of Congress who represent you to learn about what's going on in your life and how they can better serve you and you're providing them that opportunity. So thank you all so much for this opportunity and um, at the end, I'm happy to take questions. Anna, before I move into the next sure. session, just to ask you one quick question. Sure. So given that you know a lot of what we've talked about and have done in this history here has been around like pre-COVID, right? So you could do in-person meetings, we'd go visit you. But right now, um, how do people, you know, how do people in the advocacy community, if you've worked with, say, the American Cancer Society or other groups, you know, how do their advocates reach you now? What's, what's, what's a way that you find folks do this now, given that we don't, at least I'd like to say the pandemic's going to be over tomorrow, but I think we're going to be living this into next year. So what, what advice do you have for folks as to how to, how to engage in the pandemic? I would, um, I do a whole lot of conference calls and Zoom meetings. And, um, and while they're certainly not the same as an in-person meeting, I think they can be very impactful and you can get the message across. Um, and as far as the other question I get sometimes is, should I call or should I email? 
Um, you can do both. You can do either. I think emailing is probably best because I know um, I'm on calls a lot. I'm on when I'm in the office, I'm in and out of in and out of meetings most of the day. So emails are best because you might hear from me at seven or 730 when I'm finally getting through them for the day. But both are options. But I will say that for a job that I was told frequently did not before the pandemic did not translate to working from home, um, we figured it out pretty good. And I think we can have very effective advocacy meetings um, remotely, um, whether through conference calls or Zoom. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Dana, that was terrific. All right, All right. this is our concluding um, part of the workshop today. And so I wanted to invite Suzette and uh, Suzanne um, for a little bit of a dialogue with me. As I mentioned, we're gonna talk about the PRMRP program uh, we're really grateful for both of them who have served as consumer reviewers in that program. Um, let me start with Suzanne. I don't think she's going to grab one of those guitars off the wall and start playing us anything yet, but um, maybe if we have time at the end, we could get you to do that for you. We can do a little solo. Um, Suzanne, would you mind just sort of in about two to three minutes as we talked about, so what does the consumer reviewer do? What, what's, how, do how do you get involved in the program? What does that all mean? Um, so I was uh, asked, I was approached by um, Leah, who is the uh, social worker for um, MD, for the MDF. Um, and I was approached by her about joining the program um, last year. And I started last year. Um, unlike uh, NIH reviews, um, these peer review programs through the Department of Defense have a uh, uh, somebody who is affected by the disease, either a patient or um, a caregiver, in my case, I'm a caregiver, um, who is able to be a reviewer for the grants. Um, in the NIH, it's only other scientists who review the grants. Um, so this is kind of a unique program. Um, and so you get to you know, review the grants. You get to read the entire grants as a reviewer and see what the grants are specifically within your disease only. Um, and um, you get to be in the meeting and you get, to, um, you get to rate the grant and you get to have a say over whether or not the grant is good for your community and would help support your community. That's really great, thank you. Suzette, so I know you have a background as a nurse, um, but Tell me a little bit more. What, what sort of background does one need uh, in order to do this? Do you have to be a research scientist? Do you have to be a medical professional? How, how does that work? You don't have to be a research scientist or a medical professional to be a reviewer. You just have to be a person with a disease, a caregiver for someone with a disease, or um, a person in the community interested in expanding your knowledge about it. You, um, you need to be an active participant in advocacy with an outreach or support organization in your community, and you must be nominated by the, that organization. You have to have a high school education or GED, but no other higher education is required. You must be fluent in reading, writing, and speaking English have basic computer skills and be able to access a computer with internet connection. And you must be able to represent the views of your community, not just your personal perspective. That's really terrific. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, Suzanne, so tell me a little bit like, so what would the myotonic dystrophy research program look like without a consumer reviewer? I mean, what, what is it that you know, you and Suzette are able to bring to the table. How does it shape um, their uh, research funding and priorities in a way that's really, you know, important and, and impactful? Um, I'll give you exa an example. Of, um, you know, what happens in the meetings is that um, the, the scientists give a score on various aspects of the research, and then you give a score. We actually give scores only on the impact. Uh, Suzette can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I actually didn't do it this year. They didn't need me this year, so Suzette did and I didn't. She's maybe fresher in her mind. But um, you, we only do in, 
um, how impactful it is for our community. But the scientists do, you know, the research and, uh, you know, um, and they score these things. And so uh, in my meeting at one point, uh, there was a very real divergence between some of the scientists and their scores. And I thought it was really impactful that having been to these meetings, I felt that um, the specific research was something that I was hearing other people saying was something that needed to be funded that would really help um, our community along. And I said that. Um, I advocated for us and I said that it was really impactful and it made people actually, there's then a point after the discussion where people discuss their scores again. And one of the, you know, some of the low scores were bumped up and it made a difference in the, in the funding. Um, so having a, somebody there to advocate for what we care about does actually change whether or not the scientists see it as important because they're looking at the nitty gritty of, you know, was the, scient the science done exactly right in certain ways, whereas we're worried about, you know, is it going to help us right away in exactly what we need? Um, and so if you can make that case, sometimes maybe not the, the perfect science for the, for the moment might get funded anyway because it's really important science. Really great. Um, Suzette, so tell me a little bit, like would you recommend this uh, experience as a consumer reviewer to somebody else? And, and what, you know, what's the time commitment? What, what does it involve? And I know that, you know, the world has obviously changed a lot since you were involved in this. So, um, you know, traveling, you know, to DC or, or doing those sorts of things probably aren't an option anymore, but uh, describe for folks who might be interested, like, why would they want to do this and what's the commitment and, and, and how much you enjoyed it? I really enjoyed it. I've done it the last three years and that I, I wanted to say the consumer reviewer role is so vital because we help the scientists see the human aspect, the human part of it. And I mean, we all know myotonic dystrophy is so complicated and so complex, so misunderstood and so variable. And without someone there who knows the disease, who lives, who has it in their home, either has a disease or is a caregiver or someone in the community very familiar with someone with myotonic dystrophy, the, I don't think that the scores could end up correct without the input from the consumer reviewer who is the voice for the actual human side of the disease. And the consumer reviewer has full voting power as well, all equal with the scientists. So what you have to say, your, your opinions on the research study has a, a big impact. And, and it is, we, we do review the impact like Suzanne said. That, that's still it's what I did last year also. Um, you also asked me the time commitment. I've gotten faster. <laughs> this, this, I've just completed my third year. It takes me about 35, 40 hours of pre-meeting preparation, reading the proposals and getting, getting prepared to write my critiques and comments for the actual in-person or online discussions. And after that part, um, the actual, like if you go to the Washington DC in-person meeting, that's always in the greater Washington DC area and, and you'll be there two to three days. There's also video conference, teleconference and online moderated discussion panels also. And those will take like one to three afternoons to finish. So that's the time commitment. Um, also, it's not difficult for us to do the reviews because when we review them, the, they have the, the research studies in a scientific abstract and a layperson's abstract. And the lay abstract is very easy to understand. And it is, the lay abstract is written so that people with a variety of backgrounds are able to understand them and be able to come up with strengths and weaknesses in the proposal. That's terrific. Um, Suzanne, let me ask you the last sort of, you know, moderate question. I think we might have one or two in the chat. Um, what would you tell somebody about, you know, 
just, you know, how important is it to make sure that this program continues? Why is it important that we continue to advocate with our senators to remain in the program? I mean, is it worth doing? Oh, it's absolutely worth it. I mean, we're adding, you know, two to $3 million a year to research for our specific disease, which is, you know, a huge amount of money in the grand scheme of things. Um, and, you know, for us individually to go to the program at any individual meeting, you're not competing against other people exactly, you know, who are reading other proposals for other diseases. But if somebody else is not a great advocate for their disease and they're kind of like, oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of okay. And you are a decent advocate for your disease. You're, you're going to get, your things are going to get scored better and then you're going to get funded more. So the more people we have who are good advocates, you know, we're going to end up with more funding. It's just, you know, I think Dana said, you have to make the ask. So, you know, if you're the person there who's saying, you know, this really matters for our community, I really mm -hmm. believe in this proposal and it is worthwhile funding at the end of that meeting, yours is the one that's going to get funded. I've got a question here and I'm going to sort of add to it. Um, some folks were asking about, you know, how to apply or if there's a lack of consumer reviewers. Um, I think that the program, I'll, I'll sort of give my first editorial comment. I think the program's just getting started as far as our involvement in it. I would certainly like to see more grant applications coming in for you guys to have to review so that, you know, you have a stack of, you know, myotonic dystrophy research grants that are this high versus this high right now. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an opportunity to think about that so that there is a need for more um, reviewers, but is there, um, is there, are there newer opportunities that you can think of as you go forward um, for others to join into the program as, re as reviewers like you guys are doing now? Yeah, as I said, I wasn't used this year and last year I was, it was around this time of the year. Um, so I just recently found out that they weren't going to need me. Um, so I don't, I assume that was because maybe there weren't as many grants um, specific to our disease. So that's a question I don't have an answer to. Um, so it's, you know, would definitely be helpful to have more people in the pipeline, I would say, you know, in case we, you know, in case there are more grants, it's definitely good to have more people applying so there are more grants to be reviewed. Um, and, um, you know, just, you know, as we think about more opportunities, it's, it's better to have more people available to fill, you know, to fill those roles for whatever other opportunities there might be beyond this. Um, I don't know, Suzette, do you have something to add? I have reviewed other diseases besides myotonic dystrophy for the reason it, it definitely helps sharpen my skills and it helps me just to get the, the style of it down and way better. And I could just tell by the third year that I was involved in it, that I was able to do so much better than the first year. So, um, and they have always told me every year that they needed more reviewers. That's great. Well, we're just about at the end of our session here. We've got about two minutes left. So let me just do a quick wrap up. Um, you know, if you have any questions following this session, I think my information is up on the platform. So folks can feel free to reach out to me directly at my email address. You know, there are no dumb questions. Um, I'm your boots on the ground here in Washington, DC. And it's, it's my job and my passion, you know, to be your advocate and representative here. But it's always, as Dana said, important to have an, a community, you know, behind you and alongside of you as you're advocating with Congress and with federal agencies. So uh, it's just so important that folks who may not have been coming an advocate, which really just means, you know, finding your voice, finding a way to communicate to your elected representatives, you know, whether it's through phone calls, emails, meetings, eventually, hopefully in person meetings, you know, op eds, letters to the editor, anything you're able to do to create awareness and align around our mission, which is to make sure folks have access to health make sure that we drive innovation so that there's going to be, you know, FDA approved treatments and eventually a cure. Making sure that we're doing more to advance the biomedical research mission so that there's research dollars out there and we have, you know, monies available for really smart researchers who are asking those, you know, interesting challenging questions that are going to drive innovation. All of these things are important. You know, come back to the website. We try to do quarterly webinars where we talk through the advocacy program. We help provide you with tools 
you know, letters, emails, other things to help you become an advocate. Uh, I am available anytime folks want to reach out to me for phone calls and, and the like to do that. So I just want to say thank you to Dana for taking time out before the University of Alabama football game at seven o'clock. She went to law school and undergrad there and it's her passion. And I want to thank Suzette and Suzanne for taking time to be a part of this. You guys are wonderful volunteers and advocates and we're so grateful for your help uh, and your service to the organization and just thank you so much. So thank you all. I hope everybody enjoyed this and learned something from it. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kevin. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.